Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been getting through my very long to-do list of home networking projects, including things like remote backup and hosting some web apps securely behind my firewall. And what I thought I would do today is share with you some of the projects that I've been doing and some of the success that I've had with those projects. A lot of them involving my Synology NAS devices here, including a few that I have deployed to family members' homes around the area now that we're getting this fiber optic internet everywhere. So what I thought I would do in this video is kind of walk through all those different projects with you, show you how I set them up, maybe give you some ideas for things you can do at your place, and I'm hoping to get more ideas from you of things that I should try in the future as well. And we're not going to dig into the weeds on too many of these things, but just kind of give you a good overview. And if you want to see more of something, we'll come back and do a full video on it. Now, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that a bunch of these projects will be running on some Synology NAS devices that I've got here at the house. Synology is an occasional sponsor here on the channel. They also provided those devices to the channel free of charge for some videos we've done in the past. However, they are not sponsoring this video, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded, and all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. So let's get into it now and see how some of these projects are shaping up here at the house. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we did a video about TailScale, which is an awesome VPN solution that for home users is free. And what it lets you do is set up a private network where you can access your devices anywhere in the world without having to open up any ports on your router or set up any complex software. You just install the client on the devices that you want to have connected, you log in, and you're done. It just works. It's amazing. And what I did was set up TailScale on my primary NAS here at the house. And then I also set up another one that I dropped off at my mother's house. And what I've been doing is using the Synology Hyper Backup software to back up about three terabytes of data that's here at my house to her house. And it's been running now for over a day, but we're getting close to the end here. I could have set it up here and then brought it over, but I wanted to see if her internet connection could handle this much data getting pushed for this long and sustain the transfer rate. And as you can see here, we're doing about 36 megabytes per second, almost 40 megabytes per second there. She has a 500 megabit symmetrical connection, so we're very close to the maximum. And it looks as though TailScale can really provide a good amount of bandwidth, even though it's doing some active encryption of the data before it leaves the NAS here at the house. So I was really impressed with the uh, performance here, not only of TailScale, but also of her Frontier internet connection, which is basically just residential fiber. I'm on Comcast here. I'm using that Gigabit Pro service I got a little while back, which is now offering 10 gigabits of symmetrical performance. So I'm barely scratching the surface of my connection, but it's nice to see that her residential connection is largely living up to what they're marketing on it, at least right now, in that we've been running this data transfer rate now for well over a day, and it's been able to sustain it. So hopefully I've got enough storage over there. If not, I gotta drive over and <laughs> add some hard drives to the mix. But I really wanted to get this huge blob of data off-site on a more regular basis. So that's what's going to happen here. I've got you know, a smaller amount that I send up to Amazon's S3 service for safekeeping. But my big bulk of the stuff that I want to hold on to, like some media files and some other things, I haven't been able to back up off-site all that easily. Now I can here using Hyper Backup and TailScale. And I did a whole video on TailScale, a whole video on Hyper Backup. So all of those things will be in the video description if you want to learn more. And once this big transfer is done, it's only going to send over the changes. So future data transfers should be pretty quick depending on how much I'm adding to the mix each week. Now in order for this to work, you have to install the Hyper Backup Vault at the remote location. This is free software that's part of the Synology Package Center. And the nice thing is, is that it runs even on the low-end Synology NAS devices. So you don't have to buy another expensive one to set up at the remote location. So you get this going, you point your hyper backup at the tail scale address of the remote computer, and then you're pretty much good to go. Although I had to make one change, and that change is detailed on this support document. I'll put a link to this in the video description. So if you're having a hard time getting Hyper Backup to work over TailScale, you have to go in and add a scheduled task on boot up. And this has to do with how the Synology operating system handles outbound connections from TailScale. You just have to follow the instructions here on the machine that is sending the backup, the originating machine. 
and once you make this change, it works. But without this uh, setting enabled, every time you try to connect remotely, it's going to refuse the connection. But one quick change, not that hard to do, and then you are good to go. Let's take a look at some other things I've been doing here. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the DS723 network attached storage device. This is the new one powered by an AMD processor. And I'm taking the hard drives out here real quick because I did an unofficial RAM upgrade on this and I wanted to show you that it actually works. So in the review that I did, I mentioned that they want you to use their RAM only, but I had a bunch of notebook RAM kicking around. This is some uh, DDR4-2666 RAM from Crucial. So I popped this memory in. I only had two gigabytes on this to start. And this RAM has been working fine. In fact, I was expecting to get warning notices about the fact that I'm not using official Synology RAM. This is not even uh, error correcting RAM, but it's been working just fine. And I've got a whole bunch of stuff that I'm running on here. I'm really pushing this hardware a bit too. So let me put it back together and show you what's running on it. And all of it has been rock solid stable, even though I'm using mostly notebook RAM here. And I will say, of course, if you're doing something super mission critical, you'll definitely want to have the ECC RAM and do it by the book. But I think for a lot of home lab people like me, it's a lot less expensive to go with the off the shelf memory. All right, let me get this hooked up and let's take a look at what's running on it. So now we've got that 723 booted up with its 16 gigabytes of unofficial RAM. All has been good here, even with a virtual machine running in the background. I've got a four gigabyte Debian VM here running, and I'm going to show you what I'm running on that in a minute. And it's been stable here for the better part of a week at this point. So I'm, I'm not complaining here, and I think you can get away with this also within your home lab environment. Now, this device is also running with Synology's DSM 7.2. And in that version, they overhauled the container manager for Docker. Now, if you haven't played with Docker yet, it's a rabbit hole that once you go down, you're gonna get all sorts of amazing ideas because it makes hosting applications so much simpler than having to install them line by line through a multitude of commands. And some Docker containers are a little more complicated than others, but for the most part, you can get a pretty sophisticated self-hosted web app up and running with just a couple of clicks. They're very easy to update. They're very easy to move to different servers. It's an amazing way to host things. And I'm hosting a couple of things right now. And what I like what they've done with Container Manager is they've simplified the process of upgrading containers to new versions. Now you can just do it with a single click as opposed to this process you had to go through before. Additionally, it now supports Docker Compose files so you can more easily get your Docker projects put together and for more complex ones that involve multiple containers that all have to work together, it'll now organize things into a project where all of those containers are in one place. And I found it to be a lot easier to get some of the more complex projects up and running, although I'm still struggling a bit with it. Now, what containers am I running? Well, the one that I was very excited about is this one called Pingvin. And what this is, is kind of like a roll your own WeTransfer. So if you ever have a big file that you want to send to somebody, you could go to WeTransfer and upload it, but they have a two gigabyte file limit. And then of course, if you don't pay them, you don't get as much features out of the product that you might like. And of course you're putting it on somebody else's server. What this is, is a self-hosted version of that. And what it lets you do is upload files of any size and send custom links to people for them to download those files. You can let others use it as well. You can set up different users on it. And they have another neat feature. Let me go over to it real quick where you can actually reverse the process. So right now I've got one file that I'm sharing with a friend of mine. But if I go up here and select reverse shares, I can send out a link to somebody where they can connect and send files back to me without having to set up an account on the system. So a really good way of just getting files back and forth without complexity, because a lot of people can't handle FTP. Uh, certainly email can have its limitations and the files can expire after a certain length of time. You can have them expire after a certain number of downloads, for example. Just a lot of cool stuff that's integrated into this that you can host yourself. Now, one of the things that I've always been reluctant to do is put stuff on my home network on the public internet. And even though this file transfer application is available on the public internet, it's not resolving to my IP here at the house. 
and normally you would do something like reverse proxy to get something like that done, but I found something better that a lot of people have been talking about, which is called Cloudflare Zero Trust Tunnel. And I could do a whole video setting this up, but Network Chuck did a great video about how this works, and I would suggest you check him out. And I've got a few other videos I'll put in the playlist that add some detail to this. Basically, this is another VPN-like service, but it allows you to expose things safely to the public internet. And what happens here is that I've got a second container on that device that communicates with Cloudflare. And when somebody goes to that file transfer application, it resolves to Cloudflare's servers, not to my IP. And my system then sends things through Cloudflare over to the user that is logging into it. So it's a lot safer than just opening up a port and you've got Cloudflare kind of backing it up. Somehow, this is free right now for regular users here. If you go over to their thing here, you can see $0 per user. Uh, I don't believe it's in the terms of service to host your own website using this or some kind of public tool. It's really designed for you know, mostly VPN-like applications. And one other cool thing about this is that you can lock the service behind a login first that Cloudflare controls to add some additional layers. And this works a lot like Tailscale in that you log in with your Google account and then it lets you over to the service. Or you can just make it publicly accessible like I did. But either way, your machine is still safely behind your firewall, yet you can share these services individually outside. And again, if you want to see more on this, I will do a whole video on how to set that pingvin thing up. I think it might be helpful for some of you, um, but there is some really good content already about Cloudflare Tunnel that I would suggest you check out first. But it's a real game changer in that I can do things that I was reluctant to do before. Now, one other safety measure I've got here in the house is that this Synology NAS is connected to a totally different internet connection than everything else here. And that's because this Comcast gigabit service has two connections. One is a symmetrical one gig, and the other is a symmetrical 10 gig. So I put the Synology NAS on its own on that one gig leg that I really haven't been using all that much. So I'm able to keep it isolated from everything. And again, I'm not doing anything too crazy with it, but it's been really fun to just experiment with something that is relatively safe to expose to the world to a small degree. Now, one other thing I've been playing around with is something that I installed on that virtual machine called PeerTube. Now, PeerTube is open source software that basically allows you to spin up your own version of YouTube on something that you can host and control yourself. Easier said than done. It's not an easy process to get it installed, not the least of which is the Docker version, which I'm still struggling with, although I'm making progress on uh, Docker with the new DSM 7.2. But I did decide to follow their instructions for setting it up on a standalone server, and that's their recommended at the moment. And so I installed Debian on the Synology virtual machine, again, running on that very same uh, two drive device you just saw. I gave it four gigabytes of RAM, and then I spent all of last night following the directions, and check it out, I got it working. I had this routing through Cloudflare, and I put up one of my videos here just to see how it would work. So let's click on it here. And as you can see, it jumped right to where I last left off in the video. It's super quick. And I think Cloudflare is contributing to that quickness um, because I'm basically going through them and not through my local network. That little server is communicating with Cloudflare and then back down to me. But as you can see, as I jump around here, it responds just as quickly as YouTube does. And I was really impressed with that. The other thing that it does is it splits the video up into chunks and kind of distributes it the same way YouTube does. So if you ever watch your YouTube videos when you click on them, you don't get the whole video downloaded. It just downloads the spot that you're watching and it does the very same thing here. And what they do in an effort to reduce the overall bandwidth is run a peer-to-peer -peer system. So if other people were on the site right now, they would be sending video to each other to help each other watch the video live. So a little earlier, I emailed a bunch of people and had them all connect in at the same time. And sure enough, it was showing that four peers were communicating with each other. And my unit here was sending some video chunks out to other people that were watching at the same time, which I thought was really cool. So it's something I'm gonna to continue to play with. I do wanna get it working in Docker so I can make it more portable. Um, it's probably easier to spin this up on 
a hosted server somewhere, but that of course brings cost, especially when you have to pay for the bandwidth going out. And here at my house, I don't have to do that. Although again, if I were to open this up to the world, I think I would be violating the terms of service of Cloudflare. So we're gonna keep it safe here, but I was very impressed that I could get this working and uh, see just how nicely this does run, uh, basically being served from a little Synology NAS device in my closet over there. So more to come on this. Uh, once I find a good hosting solution that I think I can do without violating any terms of service, I will let you know and maybe we'll have our own little private lawn.tv server out there. And another cool thing about PeerTube is that it is federated a lot like Mastodon is. So other instances can grab my feed and mirror it on their own server. So it's really cool and really I think how the internet was supposed to work before all these platforms took over. So I'll keep playing with this and keep you posted on it. But uh, I felt very accomplished here getting all of this stuff to work. And I just wanted to share this with you. I know typically I go into more detail and I'm happy to do it. But I did want to put this out there to see what interests there are in different parts of this discussion. And then we'll come back and do some more detail on all of it. But I'm having a great time here with Tailscale and the Cloudflare tunnel. It really opened up a lot of things that I can do now on my local network. And in my area now with so much fiber optic all over the place, I can start dropping these servers everywhere. I got one at mom's house already. Maybe I'll take one over to my sister's place and just have uh, some little servers I can pop out of uh, whenever I want to host something that I don't want to keep here at the house. So more to come. Very excited about all this stuff. And I am really getting into this home lab stuff now. And there's a whole community of home lab content out there on YouTube for me to consume and for you to find as well. So that's going to do it for now. Again, let me know what you want me to look at next in the comment section. And until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic AGR, Tom Albrecht, and Om the Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.